Good afternoon. Today I signed House Bill 5001, the General Appropriations Act, otherwise known as the State Budget. We worked uh, very hard uh, throughout the end of last year and then into the legislative session on some really key initiatives, teacher pay, environmental restoration, and I really enjoyed working with the legislature. I think that they worked very hard. Um, I think that they uh, did a, a really good job. We had uh, big achievements and big gains. Uh, at the same time, uh, as the budget was coming due, uh, we started to see the economic effects of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, which has changed the trajectory of the nation's economy and obviously the economy here in Florida and has, of course, affected the budget balances. And so as we were looking at the budget, my goal was to uh, try to safeguard the historic achievements that we were able to do while also realizing historic savings so that we could put Florida on a more solid fiscal uh, foundation. And so that's what we did uh, over the last many weeks, going through a lot of different provisions of the budget. So the legislature approved the budget totaling $93.2 billion. Uh, with today's actions, my, veto, my vetoes will total over $1 billion. Uh, despite the unprecedented circumstances necessitating the level of reductions, uh, this $92.2 billion approved budget provides significant support for education, uh, the environment, infrastructure, child welfare, and more. And I would note that given po Florida's population growth, it is a decline in per capita spending uh, over last year's budgets. So while these actions uh, uh, total over $1 billion, uh, roughly half of that is general revenue, uh, half is trust fund balances. They will be set aside uh, for whatever uh, needs may arise in the coming year. Of the $1 billion in total vetoes, and I think this is important because uh, everyone understands the circumstances have changed. When we did our budget uh, back in the fall, uh, we were operating under a certain uh, set of assumptions. And we always knew that we could see uh, an economic downturn, but I don't think we necessarily forecast the economy simply stopping for a time. Uh, so we were operating under a certain set of assumptions. The legislature was as well. Um, as the reality changes, uh, I think we all have to recognize that none of us are going to get everything uh, that we want. Um, and so I thought it was important that, that I was stepping up to the plate on that as well. So of the one billion in vetoes, over 550 million are vetoes that I included in my governor's recommendations uh, in, in the fall. Uh, and this includes uh, vetoing the $20 million job growth grant fund, which is a great tool for a governor to have to be able to use. Of course, once the coronavirus pandemic hit, uh, we, I stopped spending money out of the uh, balance previously. Uh, so that's about a $25 million reversion. And then we're vetoing the $20 million uh, for this year, which is something that's uh, important. Uh, I, I, I want it, uh, but at the same time, you know, sometimes things just need to be put on pause. So we anticipate nearly $800 million of funds reverted by state agencies for the current fiscal year, bringing total unallocated general revenues for the next fiscal year to $2.3 billion. Florida's reserves are also bolstered by the Budget Stabilization Fund, which is about $1.7 billion, uh, the Lawton Child's Endowment Fund, about $800 million, and $1.5 billion in unallocated trust fund balances. So in total, Florida stands with $6.3 billion in total reserves, uh, which you know, we may need to absorb the revenue losses uh, that we have experienced due to COVID-19, uh, while also leaving the state ready to weather any storm that the economic recovery uh, may throw our way way uh, going forward. Uh, and that, of course, does not include uh, federal dollars from the Federal CARES Act, which we uh, have also used and, and will continue to use. When I announced my budget at the beginning or at the end of 2019 for the 2020 year, we focused uh, primarily on a couple things, one of which was uh, teacher salaries. Uh, we wanted to take Florida from the bottom half of the country in average minimum salary uh, to the top five. Uh, it was not an easy fight. There was a lot of folks that didn't want to do that. Uh, and I'm just pleased to say that we uh, were able to get $500 million to uh, increase the average minimum salary in the state of Florida for K through 12 teachers, uh, as well as including money 
uh, for salary increases uh, for teachers uh, who are more seasoned and other eligible personnel. So we are now uh, in the top five for average minimum salary. Uh, and I think that this is really a historic achievement. I want to thank the members of the legislature uh, who supported this really key initiative. Uh, we also have other key initiatives regarding K through 12, workforce, higher education, uh, all trying to prepare our students for the future. Uh, we do have the highest funding ever for K through 12 schools uh, with an increase of $137 per student, uh, $100 million for mental health programs in our schools, which is a $25 million increase over last year's funding, an additional $22.8 million for a total of $1.3 billion in state operating funds for Florida's colleges, and an additional $44.4 million for a total of $2.7 billion for Florida's universities. And we did not increase tuition, uh, which I think is very, very important. Budget also maintains important funding for practical skills-based education opportunities, including workforce initiatives and computer science education, $10 million to cover the cost of training and to provide bonuses to teachers who hold educator certificates or industry certifications in computer science, $10 million for the Pathways to Career Opportunities grant program to establish or expand pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs for high school and college students. 30 million for state colleges through the two plus two student success incentive fund and work Florida student success incentive fund to help students graduate on time and align career programs and workforce demands and high wage job opportunities. One of the big initiatives of my first year in office was support for Florida's water resources and Everglades restoration. Uh, we sought uh, $625 million uh, to continue the momentum and the progress on those projects. Obviously, we were able to pass uh, a couple very good water resources uh, policy bills, um, which we uh, will we'll be signing very soon. Uh, uh, but the money is important, got to get the policy right, but you do need some funding. Uh, this budget continues the commitment that we made by allocating more than $625 million to restore the Everglades and protect our water resources. And this is two years in the row that the legislature has stepped up and really put uh, their money uh, into this key in, these key initiatives and I think ways that the Floridians really appreciate. Uh, so we're looking at over $322 million for Everglades restoration, $50 million for Springs restoration, $160 million for targeted water quality improvements, $40 million for alternative alternative water supply, and $25 million to combat harmful algal blooms and red tide. We also uh, have a budget that supports the mission of public safety. Uh, we are taking steps to fund pro innovative programs, safer correctional facilities, and evidence-based program for at-risk at youth. Uh, specifically, we have $2.3 million to implement the first statewide behavioral threat assessment strategy in the country more than $54 million to provide a retention pay plan to correctional officers, correctional probation officers, and other security services personnel, $17.3 million to begin transitioning correctional officers from a 12-hour shift to an 8.5-hour shift, uh, and $15 million to fund prevent prevention programs for at-risk youth. We also understand the importance of infrastructure, particularly in a state that has added population. Uh, this budget fully funds uh, the DOT work program at $9.2 billion. Uh, this is vital funding to increase infrastructure capacity, new highway construction, bridge repairs, and seaport aviation and transit program improvements. Uh, the budget also provides $145 million for workforce and affordable housing programs across the state to help working families meet basic housing needs. And of course, this is in addition to the $250 million just announced this week to address affordable housing needs due to the economic downturn uh, pro uh, caused by COVID-19. Uh, so that total amount is more than what was in my budget or what was in the enacted or the, uh, the legislature's uh, Appropriations Act. Uh, the budget puts Florida families first and helps some of our most vulnerable populations. Uh, we have a, an increase in funding for child welfare, over $53 million to effectuate important reforms to our system to enhance provider accountability and the quality of care a child receives. Uh, we've also made it a priority to fight against the national opioid epidemic and substance abuse in general. The budget includes more than $138 million in state and federal funding for the opioid epidemic, another $8 million to continue providing community-based behavioral health services. Uh, we also have $8.7 million in new funding 
to support the Office of Public and Professional Guardianship to help ensure the legal rights of older Floridians are protected and eliminate abuse, neglect, and exploitations of our elderly population. Further, the budget contains more than $97 million to fund the Agency for Persons with Disabilities Waiver Program that affords people with developmental disabilities the ability to live, learn, and work in their communities. Uh, this was, uh, these were diff difficult circumstances. Had the legislative session been a late session this year, the budget that the legislature produced probably would have looked different uh, than the one that it did, uh, given that the budget was produced right on the cusp of uh, the economic dislocations uh, wrought by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, but I want people to know, particularly those in the legislature, uh, there are obviously things that I vetoed that I think um, you know, could be good policy. Uh, there are specific projects in there that under normal circumstances I would have supported. Obviously, I vetoed some of my own key initiatives. Uh, and so, but I think that these steps are necessary in order to make sure that we are still on a stable fiscal foundation. Uh, as we get into next year, uh, some of the things that didn't make the cut, um, if we're looking at a healthier outcome or a healthier progression, then obviously I think we will see a lot of this stuff uh, be, be back in play. So uh, I appreciate the hard work that folks in the legislature uh, did over these many months. Uh, were, these were not easy decisions, but at the end of the day, you know, I think we threaded the needle by uh, preserving some of the historic achievements that this session uh, rot, such as the uh, teacher uh, pay increase, such as the environmental funding, uh, while also realizing the historic and necessary savings uh, that you have to do um, in these types of fiscal situations. And so I want to thank everyone for their, for their efforts. And um, I signed the bill before I came out today, and that will be, it should be uh, disseminated to the public very soon if it hasn't already. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, Michael? By my count, uh, the state's burned up about a third of its reserves and about half of its unemployment trust fund today, as of today. Why didn't you make deeper cuts? Well, look, this, 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 nobody has ever made more vetoes than I did um, right here. I don't think it's, they, they've ever vetoed a billion dollars. Um, it's a huge part of the actual um, uh, budget as well in terms of the general revenue. Uh, so we did an awful lot, but we also look and see uh, we have unallocated money that, that, that's left over. Obviously, the vetoes, obviously, budget stabilization. We're going to do agency hold back, uh, which we think will be $750 million. Uh, we have uh, different reserves, and then we also have Federal CARES Act dollars. So, so I'm convinced that we'll be able to, you know, to weather the storm um, and, and do, it, do it right. Did you veto the uh, state worker pay raise? I did not. I, I approved it. The pay raise, um, you know, obviously that was packaged with a bunch of things, um, including the contributions to the pension system. We want to continue to do that uh, as well. And um, uh, we were able to make the numbers work. And look, a lot of people have worked very hard over these last three or four months. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's been a lot. I know many of our key agencies have been working around the clock. So um, I thought it was merited. And uh, I wouldn't have done it if we couldn't make the numbers work, but I think we made them work. What, yes, sir. What, what is Florida not getting from the federal government you think we could use? There's been discussion about a second CARES Act package that might be passed uh, in the late summer or early fall. What more does Florida need? Well, look, I think that uh, if they do do some type of assistance to the states, I think it'll be uh, what I've told them is, um, you know, we, we were in good shape, but I mean, any issue we had or any state had pre-existing the pandemic, that's not appropriate to do. But if you do look at the loss of revenue, unfortunately, we haven't lost as much as I think was initially predicted. Um, I think it'll be for this fiscal year, uh, the predictions were a lot higher. I think we're going to be even under $2 billion um, in terms of the last, uh, last few months. So, but I think that that lost revenue is something that was a result of you know the national policy in terms of in terms of how to do the pandemic. And so if they want to they want to deal with that, um, you know obviously I would be I would be supportive of doing it. But I, I definitely do not think that they should do any pre-existing problem we had before that. Um, you know we need to figure that out on our own. Um, I, I don't have the exact number, um, you know, off the top of my head. I mean, there were some um, provider increases that we approved, and there were some that um, that we went ahead and, and said that we'll wait till next year. I mean, some of them had already had increases, uh, so there was a it was a mix in terms of that bucket. Hey, uh, affordable housing, you know, restricting you know, on affordable housing, which you would want to leave untouched that trust fund. It sounds like from what you described a moment ago. 
It's not been diverted. So we did the 250 million from the CARES, which is kind of the because um, I, I really believe every, pretty much any economic hardship right now is going to be tied to this pandemic. I mean, it's, it's pervasively affected our economy. So I think that that's going to allow them to do, you know, what, what, was, uh, what we would have wanted to do in some instances, but I think that was, uh, that was good. And then the, the, uh, the sale program was approved, and so that will help uh, produce more, more low-income housing. So you end up having uh, more money than was actually in, in the budget. Um, and so the, the sale or the ship is a is a reversion back for the balance um, but it's not necessarily being spent on anything else it's trying to trying to save it Well, I mean, not, not in signing the budget, I mean, but I think we're looking at uh, the uh, increases that we're getting in terms of um, the FMAP will, will take some pressure off the general revenue um, going forward. And yeah, we definitely anticipate that for sure. So you did not need to have any general revenue in the Medicaid budget? I don't think so. Yeah, no, I don't think, I don't think we did. Yep. Yes, sir. about a malicious law, the patch alarm bill. There was an $8 million appropriation for that. Do you know if that survived the veto's? I don't, I think it was approved, correct? Yeah, it was approved. Yep. We did support the nursing home rate increases. Yep. I mean, you know, that's been the ground zero for uh, dealing with the pandemic and uh, it's been, it's been tough and we've obviously provided you know, the bulk of our efforts or at least a major part of our efforts have been support those institutions. And so I thought that it was uh, uh, particularly right now, I thought it made a lot of sense to support that. So Governor, um, you talked a lot about uh, what you preserved in the budget, budget including education and environmental programs, but can you go into more detail about what you cut and particularly your own priorities? So we did, we cut the, um, I see the Job Growth Grant Fund. Uh, we did the um, Universities of Distinction, which is kind of a new program to not, not the performance that the preeminence funding, which UF and FSU was kind of a new thing. Not the worst idea in the world, but now was not the time uh, to do it. We vetoed a big courthouse uh, for the second DCA that was supposed to go in Pinellas County. Obviously, we mentioned the ship. So, you know, you're looking at, um, hundreds of millions of dollars from some of the bigger ticket items and then um, a lot of the smaller projects. One of the things people will look at when they go through, last year, if you remember, we obviously wanted the major water initiatives, and I think those were very important, but I also approved a whole host of, of really local, more parochial water stuff. And I mean, I like a lot of those projects. Obviously, the local uh, communities have a responsibility in some of that as well. We looked in the stuff that was not in the B map, and a lot of those didn't make the cut. Um, again, not, I think some of them are, are good, uh, but we just had to figure out, okay, what's the priority? So those are things that uh, if the situation improves, then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at it next year. Governor, Sir. Jacksonville imposing a mask requirement? So we've, um, you know, advised from the beginning of May um, about situations where, where that would be appropriate, but we've left it to the locals to, to make decisions about whether they want to use coercive measures or impose any type of, of criminal penalties. You know, we're not going to do that statewide, um, but, you know, we've wanted to have a collaborative effort with the locals from the beginning. Uh, different uh, areas have, have handled this differently based on their facts and circumstances. And even today, um, you know, you see obviously discrepancies throughout the state um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the course of the pandemic. So we've worked very closely with Jacksonville, just as we've worked with the folks in South Florida and others, and we're gonna to continue to do that and, and support efforts that, that they think are appropriate um, in their given jurisdictions. Thanks everybody. Thank you.